Hi, last year you probably saw that I made two different versions of an NTP LED clock, one with the matrix at the bottom and one with just the clock face. And I kept getting emails asking if it was possible to make a version with the WS2812 LEDs. So here we go. This has just arrived today, assembled at JLC PCB, and some interesting things to note about this design. So as you can see, I've literally just unpacked this and you'll see it is fully assembled. I don't have to do anything here other than programming it up. So we've got a through hole connector. We've also got one for programming. Uh, we've also got the ESP32 module and it appears that they've really increased the number of components that you can get assembled onto your PCB using their SMD assembly process. But they've also included some through hole parts for connectors and there's actually quite a wide range of parts also, there are some BGA parts as well, which is quite interesting. I haven't got a need for any project at the moment that needs BGA parts, but they really look like they're starting to increase the capability. Sadly, it's still only one-sided assembly, so we can't get any components put on the underside, but in this case, I haven't got any. Uh, you'll also see it's made with a black PCB. I've managed to refine the design of this one because it's a lot less complex than the previous LED design. So this one is simply a two-layer board, so the cost is quite a bit less for this board and it means we can have it with the nice black finish. So here is our ESP32 which is nicely soldered in and that saves us a little bit of trouble. If you did watch the previous videos you'll know I was chasing a bug for ages. It turned out I had a little solder bridge underneath the ESP32 because these castellated contacts are actually quite fine pitch. We've got a couple of uh, positions here for a resistor that's just to change the GPIO pin used for the WS2812s. And you can see our switches for the programming. Uh, we've got one of the connectors here and it is a manual process. So these are hand soldered after the fact, but it looks like it's a reasonable solder job. Same on the contact for the DC input. And then we've got uh, a bank of capacitors. This may not be a good idea. Um, I might do a video at some point in the future about why large capacitances on the output of your voltage regulator are not necessarily the best idea. Uh, but because we've got quite a lot of LEDs, I didn't want the, um, the regulator struggling too hard with the transient peak currents. Um, so we've got a few test points this time. We've got a pad here for measuring the LED voltage. Uh, one just to check that the feedback voltage is correct. We've got a little bit of electronics here. What I learned from the previous PCBs is that it's really useful to be able to turn off power to the LEDs until you actually need it because, uh, for example, on the matrix board, sometimes the peak current is so high when you first power it up that if you power it from a DC uh, output that has some kind of current limiting, it can cause it to go into shutdown. So this will mean that we can limit the original inrush current into our board. We've got a 3.3 volt regulator here for the logic on the board and a pre-regulator getting it closer to there. Um, so that's a LM78M08 8 volt regulator. And then you can feed in anywhere from 12 volts all the way up to 24 volts. Here are our LEDs. They're the WS2812 mini LEDs. So a little bit smaller than the standard ones, but the routing was actually pleasantly straightforward because you basically just have one serial line that you feed in and then you can just daisy chain all of the LEDs off that. The top of the PCB is our ground plane and the underside of the PCB is our supply for these LEDs. So we can just get the ground uh, from, uh, you know, just literally attaching to the ground plane. And then we've got a capacitor for each LED and then a via through to the other side. So routing relatively straightforward. If we look on the other side of the board, you can see that there is a circle here. This is our power plane for the LEDs. So that's the five volt supply. And then around that is our 3.3 volt supply for the logic on the PCB. Now in terms of cost, I think it's pretty good value for what we've got here. So the PCB itself was $36 for five of these boards that are 250 by 220 millimeters, which in my opinion, I think that's a, a real bargain. It is a black PCB with a hot air sod level finish. They don't offer the Enig for the assembly service, so it does have to be hot air sold level finished. Other than that, nothing else really here, other than I did pay extra because I was interested to see what paper between PCBs actually meant. And it turns out when you select that option, 
the PCBs are packed a little bit better so you get this nice foam between all of the boards protecting the components because I know a few people have complained that they've ended up with slightly scratched boards so basically you're paying a small fee for this anti-static foam to be placed between every PCB so that there's no contact with any of the others. So I think that's probably a worthwhile small addition if you do care about how your PCB actually looks. In terms of the assembly, it cost $196 to get five of these boards fully assembled, and that includes the cost of the components, which was $118. There is a fee because almost all of these components on here are non-standard parts, so they have a fee for every type of extended component that you use. And then the assembly fee, $12, that is the hand assembly fee for all of the through-hole parts on the PCB. So overall, I think we're talking about $230 for five of these fully assembled clocks, which I think is quite good value. Now, in anticipation for the arrival of this PCB, I have been playing around with one of these ESP32 dev boards to try and get the WS2812s working. And it's been a little bit of a journey because a lot of the ways that you might want to use to send data out to these LEDs, once you start doing stuff on Wi-Fi, it just seems to eat up the CPU cycles and then you start to get flickering or weird colours because these LEDs, because there's no separate clock signal, they're extremely reliant on very tight timings. Finally, I've got it working using the SPI peripheral and the DMA to do all of the transfer, so it's not using many CPU cycles to actually send the data out. And here is a WS2812 strip, which is representing the seconds going around the clock. So you can see one every six LEDs is illuminated. That should represent uh, these little marker LEDs. And you can see it is counting in seconds. So it's slowly incrementing. I'm hoping that I have the firmware to a point where we might just be able to flash it on here and it might just work. I spent last night trying to get the bitmaps for the clock face working um, but all I can do is verify that the C code seems to be working not that it actually does the right result with the LEDs so we will programming up in a minute what we need to do first of all is to power up the PCB and just check the voltages and I'm a little bit nervous about this um, because we've got quite a powerful DC to DC converter here which if it's set incorrectly and we don't have exactly 5 volts and we end up shoving 8 volts or something through to these LEDs, then we've got a good chance of blowing most of them up. Also, uh, obviously I'm nervous that all of these LEDs are the wrong way round. I think they're correct, but you never know until you start powering things up. So first of all, we'll apply some power, check the 8 volt and the 3.3 volt regulator. Um, by default, the... DC to DC should be turned off, so we should be safe from that point, and then we can apply a signal to enable it and check the output voltage. Right, so I've got the current limit set up on the power supply. It's set to 250 milliamps and a 12 volt output. So we'll put the probes on here and just check what's going on. Let's turn on the power. So 12 volts, that's a good start. It's drawing about 100 milliamps, which is quite normal because the ESP32 does start running the bootloader the moment you turn it on. Let's check our 8, eight volt regulator. 7.94, that's pretty good. 3.3 volt rail on the test pad. 3.266, so that's fine. And I'm not sure if it's showing up very well. You can see there is a yellow LED. That means that this regulator is in shutdown. So this is one way you need to pull the enable pin to ground if you want it to turn on. And you can see it sitting there at about 1.855 volts. That's because we've not driven that pin with the ESP32 just yet. So this should not be outputting anything. So just to explain a little bit further what's going on there, we've got our supply voltage in that goes through a diode to our L78M08 8 volt regulator and then through to an AMS1117-3V3, which is our 3.3 volt rail. And then we've got a completely separate string with a reverse protection polarity diode again. There is going to be some voltage drop across here, but I'm not too concerned. That goes into an LM2596SX adjustable voltage regulator. And you can see we've just got a standard book type arrangement with the resistors selected so that we should get 5 volts output. 
then we've got a bunch of capacitors on the output here. But this is the shutdown pin. So normally what will happen is you will get your 24 volts or 12 volts going through to this node here, also going to V in on the regulator. Then you've got a pull-up resistor here which pulls the on-off pin high and that means that the device is shut down. Now because we're actually driving this with an ESP32 as well to enable that pin, if we were just to feed that node in here, this could float anywhere up to 7 volts. So basically what I've got is an LED so that we've got a visual indication that it is in shutdown, but also just a xenodiode with a 3.3 volt rating, so that the voltage that we see at this node is never higher than 3.3 volts, so protecting the ESP32. So I think we're just going to go for it and try and program it with the software that I've written so far. I've got no idea if that software is fully functional, but it should definitely illuminate some of the LEDs. So let's connect up the uh, little programmer board. Right, so I think everything's connected up properly here. I decided to shelve the idea of Wi-Fi printing to the 3D printer, so I just went back to using an SD card. The main reason I wanted to look at the Wi-Fi printing was because I have had those micro SD card contacts wear out on the card readers, so I was trying to eliminate that. But um, that's the little Neon project finished, so hopefully this should program the ESP32. I've never used it before until now. So um, we've got power turned on. Uh, so let's go to Eclipse. And we've got the software here that I have running on that... NeoPixel strip. So it should do something with the LEDs. So we're looking in the area here to see if it detects, and it has. It's now programming the device. Okay, so it's booting up. Let's have a look to see if we get anything on the clock. Oh, it's, it's almost correct. Let me just turn down the lab lights. It's not quite there. I've got one bug there that I can see. Uh, 14.08. So yeah, that's exactly the right time now. The camera's having a hard time focusing. But I don't know if you can see, we're illuminating the wrong pixel here for the marker. So we should have all of these internal LEDs lit up the whole time but we've got the one next to it illuminated, so the seconds count isn't quite going right. It's going round here and around. But the clock face is working perfectly, as far as I can see. Uh, ignore the pattern of the colours. I've just got it going through a rainbow pattern. And there we go. That is working now. I was just one out in my counting of the array. So let's just double check the LED voltage, because I'm letting this run, but I haven't actually checked to see whether we're getting a stable 5 voltage to those LEDs. So we'll put one probe on zero. And 4.96, that looks pretty stable. It's drawing about 400 milliamps from the 12 volt source. And this should be good all the way up to 24 volts without any trouble. In fact, I'll just test that now. Yeah, no problem. I think it's all working. Yeah, all working quite nicely. So I'm pretty happy with how this has turned out. It turned out also to be quite straightforward to get the firmware up and running on this PCB. I was expecting just a whole load of mess all over the pixels, but it looks like in my few hours of clarity that I had last night where I started rewriting all the code, I got pretty much all the way there. Now I'm refactoring all of the code at the moment. I'm using the same piece of code to drive this the standard LED version and the LED matrix version. There's just going to be a hash define at the start to pick which PCB it will be driving. And obviously I'm going to upload that to my website along with the PCB files for this so that you can build your own. Uh, there's just one bug that I need to fix on the matrix version um, in that if you're connected to the Wi-Fi but your internet connection gets lost, when it tries to do a call to the weather uh, because at the bottom on the matrix, I've got some weather information for the day. Uh, if it tries to do a call for that, for some reason it crashes. And even though it's handled by an error handler, uh, there might just be something very simple wrong, but it seems to reboot and then um, try and boot up again. So I've got a little bug to fix there. Also, I want to obviously make some changes to this. At the moment, the way this works is this is one continuous strip of LEDs, basically, and then it goes on to the digits and fills them up. 
uh, all the way around and then the last LEDs over here somewhere. So I'm filling this all up with sort of the rainbow colour and then I'm blanking out the LEDs that I'm not using at that particular time. So what that means is you can fill that array with any colour that you want and just do whatever you want with that array and it will make it happen on here. The step after that is where it blanks out the pixels. So what it means is we can arrange the array in such a way that you could have some funky patterns if you wanted them on this display. That isn't the reason why uh, people were asking for this. I think they found it difficult to choose which color LEDs to go for. And if you're ordering a run of five, uh, the flexibility of these WS2812 LEDs means that you can just pick whatever color you want uh, in software. But the rainbow features aren't too bad and Camden saw me playing with the LED strips last night and got really excited about this so I think this one's going to go in his room. Now um, just regarding the PCB assembly service, now JLC PCB don't actually ask me to advertise any of this stuff, uh, it's just that for whatever reason on their website they don't really promote much to do with the SMD assembly service so a lot of people didn't know that you could get the black PCBs made I don't think many people knew that you can get some of these through-hole parts soldered into your PCB and there's quite a lot of those. And also, you can get blue PCBs assembled now, but you need to order, I think, a batch of 20 or 30 um, to do the blue assembly service. But I think that will change once more people start ordering blue PCBs. It's just that the, uh, the volumes are quite low. That's presumably further down in their popular PCB colours. So... Yeah, I'm pretty happy with how this has turned out. I'll update you when I have all of the details on the website. Hopefully you found the video interesting. And until next time, thanks for watching.